about uh, via my friends and former colleagues at Dateline NBC. In 2018, uh, the team from NBC News Studios actually invited me back to do for like a little development gig to look through the archives for old stories that might make jumping off points for documentaries. And um, I actually, before even looking, I knew I wanted to look into uh, the incredible David Reimer story uh, that Keith Morrison and Ruth Janitz had, had done many years ago because it was such a mind blowing story in and of itself, but it also seemed like really like there would be other relevance in, with our new kind of evolving understanding of gender. Um, I didn't understand yet about the uh, connection to the treatment of intersex people in the years that followed, but looking not only in the story as it aired, but also in the field tapes, there was that incredible uh, exchange that we use in the film where uh, David Reimer's making it clear that the reason that he decided to come forward and show his face and speak publicly was that he was so horrified to see that the misinterpretation of his case was being used to justify surgery on intersex people. And it just seemed, especially since he had already passed away, that it was almost like a kind of calling out from the grave of like, you know, there is more going on here, leading to look at the, you know, kind of modern day intersex rights movement, which is just you know, with River and others just growing and blossoming and doing so many cool and fascinating things that it just seemed like incredible material for a documentary. Absolutely. So when did you reach out to River and River, how did you feel when you heard from Ms. Julie Kahn? Um, first of all, thank you so much for having us. Um, Julie first reached out to Alicia, um, and Alicia reached out to Saifa, and we were all friends through the online intersex community, and um, we had hung out a few times throughout the year since I came out, um, and Alicia and Saifa were planning the protest that you saw at Juan Corneau, um, and I, they asked me um, if I wanted to come participate, and the first time I came on to set was when I was doing the posters with them. And according to Julie, I popped on the camera. <laughs> so the next day I participated in the, um, in the protest and um, I sort of had a lot to say. Um, and Julie then asked me if I wanted to participate in the documentary and to be the third subject. And honestly, I was, <clears throat> Pretty hesitant at first, just, just being this vulnerable, not in like the container of being an actor in, in a story, in a, in a movie or a play or whatever. Um, but very quickly, I found out that Julie is a filmmaker of utmost integrity and just kindness and love. And she created an environment with the crew on the set that just, it was just a, such a safe, like, safe space for me to be authentically myself. and. Um, so much so that, like, I never thought my mom would be, like, on camera like that. And, you know, to share that moment where I could, I don't know, more than just being vulnerable, just, like, really being, like, real and being myself. And I, I just credit that to Julie's amazing abilities as a filmmaker. Just speaking of... Um leaving aside my amazingness for a moment, and speaking of uh, it, the uh, cool and amazing and supportive crew, I think uh, our LA DP, Lea Nova, might be uh, here this evening, so. Stars are out tonight, wow. Yeah, um, Julie, I'm really curious to hear about um, your approach to uh, going into this process and talking to people about their trauma on camera. And I think that, you know, the documentary world is trying really hard to take accountability for the fact that, you know, um, the history of documentary has this, um, this hist there is this history of, you know, subjects of documentaries being taken advantage of or just being kind of used and then left in the dust. And, um, yeah, I'd love to hear, especially for aspiring filmmakers, like, what have you found to be the best way to approach participants in a documentary and make them feel comfortable and treat them so well? 
You know, I think, I mean, these are all big questions that are swirling around very much. I, I saw the documentary subject, as I'm wondering whether um, uh, you did as well. I kind of, in the, actually, in the midst of making this film, certainly um, raised those questions. I mean, there's a, there's a number of different things. A lot of part of what makes you sensitive in making a doc is sort of basic human human thoughtfulness and listeninghood. Um, but I, I think in, in this case, a fair amount had to do with kind of the choice of, of participants and making sure that it was people who were already talking publicly about their bodies. In fact, I learned River's story not through an interview, but through that scene that you see in the film where they're talking with a bullhorn describing you know, the pretty traumatic surgery that had happened uh, to them as a teenager. And um, it really uh, touched me listening to it. And that's kind of when it was like, wow, this person really would be um, incredible to be, to be in the film. When it came to, I was quite worried about, I mean, you know, we did have a consulting producer, uh, Shana Knizhnik, who's an intersex person. Um, oh, Shauna has. Shauna, who complicatedly I know because she was one of the writers of the notorious RBG. So, um, myself and my uh, RBG directing partner, Betsy West, had actually interviewed her, and then she comes out as, as intersex. So, it was a really nice uh, confluence. Um, but um, I had worried, like, how am I going to ask, you know, these intrusive prodding questions, what had, the first interview that I did with each participant, the first major sit-down interview, which is the sort of face quite large on camera, all of which is natural light, by the way, because it feels like, I mean, it's ironic saying this right now, but like bright lights shining into one's face can, can feel a little bit um, intimidating. Uh, so we, we did these, we did these as natural light uh, interviews. I had really planned those as like getting to know each other interviews, like building trust. Oh, I'm not going to ask a whole, like too many questions here. We'll just see how the conversation goes. And then the first two that I did, because River did come into the story a little later, so that we didn't hadn't planned out a sit down interview, but the, in the interviews with Alicia and Saifa, they just started talking. Um, I wasn't, sure we were talking about surgery at all and I, I didn't know we were talking about reproductive organs in those conversations but just saying like tell me about your childhood like th there it was um which was and almost everything they were saying was really absorbing yeah river um i'm curious to hear like uh if you have it from your perspective taking part in this, any advice for filmmakers who are trying to work on a documentary and want to be better keepers of their participants or subjects' stories and what was really helpful for you in that process? Yeah, what was helpful and inspiring for me in the process of working with Julie on this was that it felt really like a collaboration. It felt like I had just as much say in like, you know, ideas about what we were going to shoot and how we were going to, not really how we were going to shoot things, but what we were going to shoot, when, when, um, it was always an active, uh, conversation and the stream of communication was always very fluid. It didn't feel like, oh, Julie's like this director on this hierarchy. It just felt like we were all kind of team players on this. So I think for a lot of directors, I mean, myself included, uh, we have this idea that it's about control, but really it's about, I mean, it sounds so corny, but like teamwork. And, and great movies, I think, are really in that synergy of wanting to all create the best thing for humanity. And I think that's something that Julie was able to accomplish, or we all accomplished. <laughs> yes. Um, Julie, how did you find in the research process when you started speaking to people in the medical community about this and maybe like reaching out to people um, for expert opinions, et cetera, how did you find that? Was there resistance? Were people excited? Like, what was that process like? Um, you know, within 
both the intersex community and those sort of the small pool of people who've been fighting for intersex rights for a long time, I would say there was like a palpable way anticipation for like, oh yes, we've been we want we want this, you know, story to be out in the world. Um I did have the thought going in that we really needed some a medical expert to give some explanatory stuff. I knew I wanted that person to be intersex because I was trying to get away from the divide of like, oh, there's the people with the lived experience, sure, whatever. But then there are like the experts who really know what's going on. And though I actually did think it was important to have someone who was an MD, you know, and had that, you know, the credentials to, to say some things, I, I knew I wanted um, that person to be intersex. So that's how um, I, I reached out to Dr. Donald. I'm also um, curious, I really love the choice to, um, during the, the portion where we're learning about David Reimer's story, um, the choice to show that footage to Saifa and Alicia and River and then film that as well, that seemed like a really conscious, interesting choice. I'd love to hear more about that. Well, that, that was like, like a lot of things in doc world. I don't know if this is true in narrative film too, like the things that make things work often are just like, there's like a problem that you're trying to figure out how to solve. And the problem was like, well, we have these two very different stories. We've got these modern day live active people telling their life stories and out there in a verite way fighting for stuff. And then we have this like crazy stranger than fiction, 50 year old archival story. How is it going to, how are you going to feel like you're watching one movie? So, you know, the thought was like, we should be making that connection by showing pieces of this footage. Actually, but there's there's more of the footage in the film than what was actually shown. And but although as we went, once we edited that sequence together, we actually went back around and showed some additional footage to to River just to make some more um, some more of those um, connections. It was really just a way of connecting these two very disparate parts of the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought, I, it, to me, it made me feel like we were learning about it together. Like the, the audience kind of had that feeling of seeing themselves on screen uh, and doing it all as one. It also allowed, you know, there's some stuff that just needed some explanation. Like a lot of doc people, I'm trying to stay away from narration at this point, but it allowed rather than like me narrating the film, I said a couple things, except that they were in the form of questions and conversations with the participants in the film. Um, so it was kind of like cheating to put some narration in there. <laughs> um, River, I love your mom. Um, <laughs> I thought that the whole section where you go back to New Jersey was so incredibly moving, and I'd love to hear more about um, the decision to film that segment, to go home. Like, how was that whole process for you? Well, Julie is now a Jersey girl herself, too. So I think she was just, you know, channeling and wanting to yeah, you know, well, it was in that early interview that you mentioned Springsteen so then I'm like okay Springsteen's coming in here and right. that means we have to go to Jersey right um, I mean to me I we could speak about it more um, I, I honestly Bruce Springsteen had a big impact in my coming out as intersex the year that I came out is actually the year that I really got into Spring scene. It was 2017. It was the year his autobiography, Born to Run, came out, which like changed my life. Um, and I think what he speaks so poetically about growing up in New Jersey is like, you know, you're growing up a bridge and tunnel away from the greatest city in the world. And so it, you have this feeling of like being an outsider and being on the outside looking in and never quite being where you are or who you are. And that's how I always felt about being intersex. It was just like, I didn't know how to inhabit my body and I didn't know what kind of body I had. So it, it just, my love for Bruce and the way he writes about New Jersey was just always so intertwined with how I felt also about being from New Jersey. Um, and um, Julie was kind of just picking up what I was putting down in terms of that kind of poetic, you know, allegory towards 
you know, my body and my hometown and the additional layer of um, being a first generation South African American and this relationship with my parents of, you know, not being um, quite American, but, you know, having a connection to my parents and this other country and having these, these longings to to be more Salvadorian or to be more American. And again, it's this like space in, in between that um, first generation um, children of immigrants uh, wrestle with, which I think is the same middle ground as being intersex. You know, you're not quite either gender. You're not really in the binary of, of anything really, um, which is also like being from New Jersey, which is also, you know, <laughs> being, so it's like if you go, go around, or, you know, make movies about it. But um, <laughs> no, please do. I am. Okay. <laughs> Tell us more about that. What's the movie? Uh, it, it's called Pony Boy. Yeah. Woo! Yes, there was a short film. There's a short film, and right? it's now uh, a feature film that's going to come out either yeah. end of this year or beginning of next year. That's soon. Yeah, honey. That's amazing. Get into it. Get, oh, come back here with it. Honey, please invite us. <laughs> I love that. Um, I want to know, Julie, what did you learn? I mean, I I can't even imagine the amount of things, but what is maybe the thing that you, you know, hope to carry through your life most that you learned from the intersex community and making this? What? You know, uh, I mean, a lot of what I learned was some of the very specific information about what it is to be intersex and how the, the missteps, basically, that the medical community has made towards dealing with intersex people. But I think in terms of, like, what that I bring away, it really has a lot more to do with the spirit of kind of the empowering side of coming forward and fighting for yourself and others, kind of leaving aside what the results of that all might be. You know, when you start filming a Verite doc, you're thinking like, oh, what's going to be the big, what's the big final scene? Like, there's so many things that the activists are fighting for right now with, you know, there's educa- there's awareness, education campaigns, there's trying to change medical practices through medical institutions and medical schools. There's like state legislation. There's like all these fights going on. Like, which of these things are we going to follow? Because like, we want there to be the big third act victory. And then literally our second day of filming was that demonstration. And like, that's the third act victory is like people coming forward and fighting. And like, whether, whether that changes the externals or not is important, but isn't the beautiful moment. The beautiful moment is the internal moment to stand up for one's own self and others and to fight no matter what. And seeing that happen was moving to me and I hope it's moving in the film. And like my lesson is like to leave aside outcomes a little more and think what what it takes internally to to fight the fight that River and others are fighting. Yeah, I mean, I just think in general that there is so much wisdom and knowledge and perspective to be gained from the queer community, and um, I I wonder, River, uh, what kind of things that you hope um, the intersex community can teach other people, and what we you know gain from learning more about people in the full spectrum of the LGBTQIA experience. Yeah, when you said that, I thought about, like, yeah, thinking about the intersex experience in relation to the queer community. And, you know, I I have to just call it out, like, most of the queer community also still doesn't know what intersex is. And did I get a snap there? (laughs) Thank you. Um, But it's true. I think think there's this idea of when, when one group fights for something, you know, they kind of don't help the person coming after. And I think right now, especially with all these anti-trans bills happening, they all have loopholes in it to continue these 
surgeries on intersex kids and to deny gender affirmation for trans youth, but to continue these gender quote unquote normalization or mutilation um, surgeries on intersex kids. Um, but we talk about the trans portion of it, but we're not talking about the intersex portion of it at all. Um, and these are across bills in all these conservative states. Um, so my biggest hope is for the queer community um, to start rallying and galvanize behind the intersex rights movement and know that it's a, it's it, intersex people are now in the position of finally speaking out for themselves and having that courage to do so, but we can't, it's not sustainable if we don't have allies within our own community, um, let alone, you know, non-queer people as well. So, but what was your question? <laughs> um, I don't know, I, I, I lost it too, I think, in that I was just thinking about, I mean, I think it's just such a, wasted opportunity not to when people you know can when literally the the embodiment of uh going away from this binary system that we know has inherent roots and a lot of patriarchal bullshit um when we have you know a literal embodiment of that and these beautiful people in this film and around us uh i just think that there's so much that, you know, the world at large that like we don't know and that we don't talk about. And it's, to me, it's exciting to, to think about how we can see things with less binary terms. Yeah. Everything. I, I think something that intersex people really highlight, I always think of it like on, on a more philosophic or existential, maybe even metaphysical level of just, we represent the uncertainty and the unknown and you know, binaries are clean and easy to understand, but the reality is like all of us live in so many different spectrums that we can't fully even comprehend our own existences most of the time, but we pretend that we do um, because it's easier to do that and it's easier to like live an illusion. But the reality is, is that intersex people exist. The reality is, is that like sexuality is on a spectrum, gender's on a spectrum, you know? And so I think the more we can become more intimate with the unknown, um, and embrace it, the more we could all like evolve as a species. Yes. Let's get into it. Absolutely. Um, we will wrap up in just a couple minutes, but I wondered um, from both of you if there was anything that didn't make it into the film that you are sad about that you that maybe you could share with us a little behind Two things. I had <laughs> I had a lunch with my managers who are here that didn't get in. There they are. But yeah, it didn't get in. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I also had a little interview with my high school principal. It was really sweet. And like, she was like my favorite like Italian teacher. Um, I took Italian in high school. And, and, but like, I didn't know she became principal. And then, she, I like showed up in the high school and she had like a, you are all welcome here, like rainbow pillow on her like couch, which was crazy because like when I was in high school, we didn't have like any queer anything. So to now have like this like queer advocate principal was really sweet, but you'll never see it. <laughs> Special features on a DVD, maybe it's coming. Yes, there's no, the black and white scene was actually adorable. We edited it per perfectly, and it was a last minute. It was a last minute, We're like, no, this gets us got to be down to 92 minutes. So, no, it was a last minute. But I like to keep dogs to a certain length. I think that's wise. Um, was there anything that you particularly wish people could see that they missed? You know, there's a lot of information. Like, this was a tricky film in that way, because actually, like it's it, it is educational even if that's like if you, as a movie you don't want it to feel educational and, but because I do understand that people are coming into this with a very low baseline of knowledge there's like so much that you do not learn in the film so I guess I you know there, there's actually a fair amount of work that um, 
SIFA is doing to educate uh, medical students about intersex issues, and we filmed some scenes of those. It, it was interesting. It was super technical, and it sort of pulled you away from, like, the story vibe, but it was very good information. So really, more than wanting to change the film, I want people to, like, immediately start Googling after, because the information about intersex variations and treatment of intersex people and intersex human rights is out there. There's organizations like uh, Interact, the Intersex Justice Project, um, a support group called Interconnect, which all, like, there is information to be found, and I hope people go and find it. Um, I don't, you know, that's just, like, not, I like a movie to feel movie-ish, even if you happen to be learning some things, so... Awesome. Well, um, where can everybody in here tell their friends and family to see the movie? Yes, yeah, so this movie is opening nationwide this Friday, June 30th. Woo! So, Woo! so beautiful and exciting that they jumped on board um, when, you know, at the very beginning to fund this film and to distribute it. So if you go to everybodytickets.com, you can see a lot of the theaters um, that it's at some of the small indie theaters don't necessarily populate onto that site. So if you have a theater that you love that shows docs, it may, you should check out that theater. But, um, you know, in, in, uh, in LA, it's going to be at, um, AMC The Grove. It's going to be at, uh, Lenly. Um, so please tell that. your friends, say, say you of the Americana. Oh, yeah. I did not even oh, know the that. Draft house. Draft, the draft house. Yes, that's always a good. So please, please tell people a word of mouth. You use your mouth to say those words. Use your mouth. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, I want to thank Focus Features and I want to thank River and Julie. Thank you both so much for being here.